first. So stage one would allow those athletes that are currently training with a new club to commit to that club. Um, and then stage two would, we would ask clubs to post information on, uh, on our site um, regarding the number of open spots that they have, positions, um, coaches, you know, things like that, the information, like a little hub. So athletes can go to this page and they would know where to apply for a club. They would say, oh, guess what? The Spikers, they have a 14 u team that has two spots open. And um, I think I'm going to go for that. It's in my region. You know, it's perfect. Um, so it's kind of like an information hub and you can keep that updated. Similar to what our tryout um, posting is, is right now. Um, and then we would allow athletes to start applying. So this would just be a paper online application process um, where the athletes would fill in a form, send it off to a club and um, you know, the club could accept or ask for different questions and, and things like that. Um, key points are here that we are trying to keep this process in line with the current tryout window dates um, to kind of keep that uh, going. And uh, we want this to be an athlete driven process. Um, so we want to make sure that the athletes are the one applying um, and the athletes are the ones that are showing the interest. Um, we don't want to create high pressure situations. We don't want to create, um, you know, um, you know, the awkward situations. I know it's awkward. Tryouts are terrible to begin with, regardless. We all know that they're, they're tough, high stress situations, but we want to kind of mitigate that as best we can and, and just make sure that it's the athletes stepping forward. Um, and uh, we want to create uh, guard opportunities and guidelines for maybe virtual open houses as well. So kids could get to know a club prior to applying for it. Um, it's important to note um, that this process we have reviewed with a number of two committees within the OVA with the President's Council, uh, as well as the IVDC. Um, and, you know, we are constantly working on this and tweaking it here and there. Um, I don't think we're, we're quite ready yet to release the application process as we're just making sure that it's as solid as we can be before we put it out there. And that it is a contingency plan, that if permits are available and uh, tryouts can happen in your area, then, then, then that can happen. You could choose to only run a tryout if it's legal, if, you're, if guidelines are being followed. Um, Oh, thanks, Happy. IVDC, yes, is the Indoor Volleyball Development Committee, um, chaired by Bruce uh, Stafford and Paul Pavin. Um, so that you could only choose to run a tryout if it's legal to in your region, or you could possibly do a combination of the two. Um, so application for some age divisions and tryout for others, um, you know, it's up to you to do whatever would be best for your club. So that was um, a little bit of what's coming down um, the pipeline here with the triad window. I'm just gonna open the chat here and uh, go through some questions. Carrie, actually, can you yes. speak a little bit to some of the yes. timelines? I know there was a question about if people can, uh, you know, ask hmm. people to, or athletes to join their clubs right now that haven't played for their team yet, but no, um, right. obviously, if you can just kind of do some of the high level um, timelines, that would be great. Right. So, um, yeah. So the high level timelines. Oh, goodness. You're Alicia, you're testing me. I had don't, I have so many dates running around in my head. <laughs> so we would think early teens, I think we were talking about the 16 to the 18 for these, um, uh, uh these athletes that are currently training with a new club to get, uh, committed to the club that they're training with. And then we would move into the posting of information, which would just follow that. I'm sorry, I don't have the uh, exact dates. And then we would uh, actually start the athlete applications around the 19th or 20th. Um, and then that's when they would come in, um, which is Perfect. similar to the uh, tryout window. Right, so until August 31st, it's re-signing of your athletes from this previous season. And then yeah, starting in September to fall in line with what the tr previous tryout window is or the tryout window that we still have, but um, mm -hmm. we have this as another, you know, fallback plan. Um, is when the clubs at first would be able to offer spots to athletes and then the next stage would be athlete initiated. They go to a club website, fill out the application form with their personal contact, you know, links to videos, um, highlight reels if they want to be going on um, to another team and um, 
yeah, so like Carrie mentioned, the Regional President's Council and the Indoor Volleyball Development Committee and our youth competition staff have been very hands-on in trying to massage and get information out there um, and come up with a plan. Um, this information is all with the clubs right now. We're not releasing any information to yeah, yes. the public and parents. This is all for clubs. We want to get feedback. We want to work with you guys in our committees to make sure what we're doing is making sense. But once again, we need to have that contingency plan um, in place in case we can't get in the gyms right away. So if we can go to some, again, online virtual training, doing some outdoor training until we're allowed to get in gyms and permits, this is what we're trying to do, so. Yes, exactly. That's exactly it, Alicia. So, um, yeah, and you know, um, it's, um, having those two committees um, has really been helpful. Um, you know, they uh, have had some good input and I feel like we are um, moving in the right direction. And, you know, again, just giving everybody an option to find their training groups early um, to get uh, those um, groups together and, and so we can get back to playing. So, yeah. Okay. Um, I know people are questioning to what stage we're in of the tryout window process. Um, right now until August 31st, we're all re-signing athletes. There's nothing right. changing until September. Um, so we are looking to get the application process out to everyone in August. Um, most likely going to the clubs again once again to review everything prior to going to the general public. Um, and in the meantime, if you have any questions or comments or feedback, you can always email Carrie um, as well as our Committee chairs Paul Pavin uh, and Bruce Stafford on the IDB side of things, or Danny Dawson from our regional president chair. Um, but this is all very high level. Like I said, we are uh, still developing the application forms and process. Yep, and if phase three is approved, triads are allowed to happen as long as clubs can get permits. Um, you're following the OBA return to play protocols. Um, you're following gathering sizes and all that fun stuff. So Joanne will touch on that next. Okay, thanks, Alicia. Okay, uh, what's not, Lauren, am I? We have yeah, we'll pass it on to Joe now. Oh. Lauren, did you want to do any questions or you want me to continue on? Uh, maybe we'll keep going and then we'll circle back at the end. Awesome. Okay. Sounds good. Um, so I wanted to just uh, talk a bit about return to play protocol. Obviously, as you can see from the staff, um, with uh, there's a lot of moving parts happening all at the same time as um, we're trying to return to play safely. Um, I think the word phases and stages I'm tired of hearing because every uh, protocol has something different, the government, <laughs> the uh, indoor, the outdoor, everywhere else. So um, just as we're going through this, this is, um, I wanna talk, talk about the, the very first version of a return to play for indoor that applies to our, our communities that are still in stage two. And this is really, um, I wanted to also talk about what goes into a return to play protocol, which can help to understand as you're going through and reviewing ours, uh, what pieces will change, uh, what we need to keep our eye on, why it takes us um, some time to release one and they're not just automatically snap our fingers and here they are, and that they are a tool for you. So the return to play protocol is your tool to take to your facility and your permit holders. The, they actually hold all the liability as far as whether or not you can operate there. And that's why um, the rule with the OVA is we wanna make sure that you have a tool to take there. But like you said, we keep on bringing up this question and I hate to keep bringing it up, but we don't know who's gonna issue permits. We don't know which facilities um, are willing to operate. Um, the one thing that we do like compared to other sports is uh, volleyball's in a great position. Um, in the way the, the restrictions are getting eased, volleyball is a great sport to get played in their facility. So that's something that's important when you go to your facility or to try to get your permit is that your provincial sport organization, the Ontario Volleyball Association, has a return to play protocol that has been vetted through. And this is the long list of uh, in front of you. We are following government regulations. Uh, we've gone through public health authorities. 
it's gone through insurance, legal, uh, we're following our ISO protocol. So those are all the things that have to be looked at when you're looking at a return to play protocol. So we are super eager to get activity happening in there. So I always struggle to move my slide forward, I will lie. Okay, um, so just to touch on government regulations, there's um, a couple key uh, things, which is obviously we all know what physical distancing is, we don't wanna hear about it, but it's important. Um, no matter what, all the way through all the stages that are getting released by the government, physical distancing is required. So there is in stage three an exception, and I'm not going to get into too, depth, too much depth of it, but there is a little bit with team sport. So that's why we're super excited. But right now, for any communities that are in stage two, or if we hit return to it, physical distancing is required, which means that there's skill work that's allowed so if you can't maintain physical distancing you can't do it and you can't just uh go in and say oh we're all social circle that doesn't apply in an organized training activity so just keep that in uh keep that in mind um the other obviously important government regulation um is gathering size um so all of our stage two communities it's still under the 10 it's very limited um and yeah, let's just move on from that one. It's not much fun to talk about. Um, so stage two government regulations. So this, this will relate to our version, this first version of indoor return to play that's been released, um, that it's training. There's no gameplay allowed, no scrimmages, no competitions. Uh, when you are looking um, to operate um, in your area, um, please, you must be aware of your local public health requirements. So the OVA has got our return to play protocol. We have sent it to all local public health authorities. Um, so because it is, we do wanna make sure that each of the local areas are on board um, with our clubs operating in the area. They, um, we've got some really good feedback from the health authorities, but the most important thing that they've shared with us is that they're like, please utilize their fact sheets and their educational resources. So you'll see that within the return to play protocol, there's a lot of education that has to happen. If you want to operate, your coaches need to understand your participants. What are your protocols? How do you keep things safe? Um, and your local public health authority um, has all those resources done. Don't recreate fact sheets, educational resources. Don't, don't worry about any of that. I mean, they even have a sheet of how to use hand sanitizer. I mean, go for it, use their resources and uh, don't worry about recreating anything. Um, our protocols have to follow um, our NSO, Volleyball Canada. Now we're obviously, um, that's pretty easy actually for us to do because our province is slower than all the other provinces. Um, so this is where you really gotta make sure that you look to how do I keep my group size minimized so it's safe. So not just necessarily the recommendation that we have in our return to play protocol, but what's safe for your facility? What's safe for your operating? Um, how can I make sure that everyone can maintain their two meters physical distancing? Um, really uh, think about how you're gonna, keep volleyballs designated for a group? Do you mark them? Do you make sure that group one's volleyballs are all marked with a one or a one A? Uh, just be very cognizant of how you can address that because you do have to make sure that you can then clean that shared equipment and uh, try to mitigate your risk as much as you can. Obviously, we all know um, no physical contact, so eliminate high five celebrations, everything that all of our athletes love to do, unfortunately. Uh, we have to take a break from it um, so we can get our sport back to action. Um, so we, it's, I'm sure we're going to have to keep reminding athletes, um, just eliminate any of the unnecessary contact and always maintain good hygiene. Um, plan in your practices for your athletes to, you know, wash their hands, have hand sanitizer, um, all, that, uh, all that fun stuff. Um, so in order to make sure that you comply with our return to play, no matter whatever stage we are at, um, these are the components that are within it. So as I was talking about, share the protocol with the facility. It's your tool to take to them to get your permits to operate in the facility. Um, work with the, with the uh, facility operators of how you will exit and enter, how you will um, stagger starts, who else is in the facility. Is that going to work? How are you going to work together to make sure that um, you're able to um, have different start times in that group and that there's enough um, space, physical space for people to maintain physical distancing. Um, 
there's a risk mitigation assessment checklist. That's a great tool for, um, you must complete it. Um, but it's a great tool for your uh, club executive to go through and look at where are our risks? How can we mitigate it? How can we uh, be very diligent to make sure that we've considered all the different elements of where we can mitigate risk um, and make it safer for our athletes and for our coaches? So it's something to consider um, is what are your coaches going to be comfortable operating in? So make sure you talk to your coaches about it. Make sure they understand your education plan, your response plan. Um, there is a waiver that's required um, for COVID um, now. So if you are operating after September 1st, then that COVID waiver will be part of the, the, the application process for the new members. But if you are operating prior to um, August 31st, if you, do ha if you do happen to have a facility where you're going to be going indoor to do some skill work, you need to make sure that you do this uh, waiver form um, for COVID, even though the, your, your athletes have done, they may already be OVA members and have done a waiver previously. Um, the education plan, as I was touching on, is something that you wanna make sure that everyone in your club, uh, the coaches, the athletes, the parents, they know um, how, what your protocol is, how, are you, how you're operating. Um, your response plan, you want to make sure that everyone knows what to do if something does happen uh, prior, before, after. Um, how are you going to isolate an individual if they do come down with symptoms? Who, are, who do you contact? What's your local public health authority number? What's their process? Um, before any of your participants um, come and to your activity that day, they must go through health screening. Um, so you must make sure that you track that and you know that um, you know who's been at your activity session for that day and that you have all the contact tracing information. And then depending on the version for this one, obviously we're in skill work with version 1.1, there's programming modifications. And that's the uh, next step. So one thing to remember for insurance, um, as you know, and Carrie mentioned this, it's like we have to operate within the government regulations or else it's illegal activity. So uh, the insurance broker explained it very easily to me. Uh, we don't cover any illegal activity. So you don't follow protocol, there's no insurance. Um, so that's something to really keep in mind um, and to be diligent around it. Um, obviously, COVID's excluded from insurance, unfortunately, from insurance um, policies at this time. So you do have to make sure that you've done your due diligence to mitigate risk to act responsibly um, and to have all your documentation. So it's important to have the waivers, have the health screening completed, show that you've done an education plan, that you have a response plan, um, and just make sure you cover that off and, and work very diligently on those. And Joe, yeah. sorry, can I just jump in here too? Um, all of those are downloadable Word documents on the OVA website. So all the clubs have access to that information. They can just literally do a control find replace and put your club name in there to create your own plans. So it's not like you're creating things from scratch. Um, we've tried to do our best to create tools that you guys can utilize. Um, there you go. Yeah, and this is like I said, when there's so many things happening, um, there's um, information on the website. If you can't find it, please let us know. Um, as Alicia said, the info is there. Um, there's a return to play entire document of the protocol, but then there's also the appendices that are separately uh, downloadable. So please utilize them. And um, I'm gonna throw this over to LP to talk about some of the return to play protocol um, for the programming at this stage, um, which is about just training and no games being allowed. Good evening, everyone. Um... So it, it sounds like a lot of steps. Oh, we went a little too far. It sounds like a lot of steps, but um, I just want to briefly speak about uh, my experience last week. So with Team Ontario, we, um, um, we wanted to actually test it out, test out delivering sessions with, the, with this protocol. And so we did three locations um, last Friday with some beach athletes from our Team Ontario program. And it, it took a little bit of work to, um, you know, uh, make sure that we filled out our emergency action plan um, and uh, and the documentation, the rest, the risk mitigation document, uh, and we did all of that. Uh, so it took a bit of time for that, but but once it's done, um, you know, given um, provided nothing changes, um, you know, you're good to go. And then you know, you basically just follow up with um, 
with a health questionnaire um, before each session with your athletes. But uh, but we went through it and, and it was pretty smooth, and uh, and 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 we were able to run a very uh, a very good practice with uh, some of our beach athletes following um, these exact um, guidelines that I'm going to actually just talk about right now. Um, and so uh, so definitely worth it. I was definitely grateful that I was able to be on a beach court with um, some athletes just talking about volleyball, um, watching them uh, play from a distance, um, but being able to, to work with athletes, which is what we all love to do. So um, for, this, um, for this particular protocol for indoor volleyball in stage two, um, so we're still talking here about the social, uh, the physical distancing um, requirement. We're not able to play games. So we're limited to skill work. And we have to make sure that in order to um, maintain that physical distancing in our sports, we need to have drills that are rather controlled. Okay, so the key here, and if you look in the protocol, there's a series of diagrams like the one that you see on your screen uh, for each of the skill, kind of setting up uh, the stage or giving you an idea of, of, of how you can run things, um, you know, while still maintaining the two meters between athletes. But we, what we want is uh, predictable ball movement and player movement, okay? So I'll give you an example of uh, something that's predictable. So if I'm serving to uh, Lauren, who's standing across the net and she's alone in the court and I'm alone serving, I can only serve at Lauren. So that's pretty predictable as a, as a ball path. And I know that Lauren's gonna go where the ball is and there's no one else around. So that's safe. What would not be is if Lauren and Carrie are on the other side of the net, and I'm serving at, at them. And I don't actually say um, ahead of time who I'm serving to. And so in, in that situation, there's a risk that the ball goes between the two. The two become, you know, come for the same ball and they come uh, within two meters of each other. That's, uh, that doesn't allow for predictable ball and player movement. So these types of drills where there's decision-making between athletes, um, are basically not um, not part of, of this protocol. So we're really keeping it uh, simple, uh, blocked uh, types drills uh, where we can uh, where we where we know where the ball is going and we know where the players are going. So that means that you're going to have to scale your activities based on the athletes that you have. If you have 18 new you know athletes who are very skilled who have very good ball control, you may be able to have two passers on one side, of, one side of the net and two servers and they're each serving, you know, in front of them to their designated passer. And you would still be fine and maintain the distance and, and, and still be safe in this case. But if you have 13 new athletes who may not have that ball control, well, maybe that configuration for the drill is not appropriate. So it's really your job as a coach to determine what the skill level of your athletes is and what is um, appropriate as a, as, as a configuration for your drill in order to meet these, uh, these requirements. Uh, other, other couple of things that we say is that um, uh, in stage two, we're still limiting the amount of time that we're spending on court with the athletes, again, to, um, to limit the, the, the risk of, of contamination, I guess. Um, we're trying to keep the ball, the ball away from the coach. Uh, so once the athletes uh, get on court, you know, we'll have our number of athletes on our one court. They're going to stick to the same uh, set of balls. And as much as possible, if we're trying to keep the coach uh, away from the ball. Um, we recommend using uh, props. So maybe some cones, uh, maybe tape if, if, if appropriate on the floor to designate uh, spaces where the athletes can, um, can stay uh, in order to keep them away from each other. And, uh, and yeah, the, the one thing that I would say, and I'm not sure if this has been mentioned, but um, I'm pretty sure right now that across the province, um, uh, while being indoors, uh, we are required to wear a face mask. Uh, and so, um, so for coaches, who are not involved in the sport, that technically means that um, you would have to wear a, uh, a mask. So uh, that's something to consider. Check with the facility that you're using, check with your local public health, uh, make sure that you're following those, um, those rules um, as well. 
I think it covers this. I mean, there's uh, obviously this is the exact same information that we had for our outdoor protocol for stage two. And, um, and again, like I think all of us are pretty excited about stage three. And we're very excited to talk about it very soon, as soon as, as, as we have a confirmed protocol. But this is really good for us to know because what this means is that over the course of the year, when we go back indoors because it gets colder outside and potentially, um, you know, COVID comes back a little stronger uh, or there's like more cases and then the, the province has to kind of scale back. Well, maybe we can scale back from stage three to this, which is better than, you know, coming from what we used to know as volleyball to nothing at all, right? So it's really important for us uh, to know this um, as much as, you know, we're all going to want to jump into stage three as soon as possible. Um, let's, let's remember this because we may have to go back to there, uh, to this at some point. And when we do, we're going to have to do it, to, to do it well in order to be able to keep playing our sport. Um, I believe that we're going to the next uh, slide there. Unless you have something to add there, uh, Joanne? I think, do we want to do some of the return to play questions, Lauren? Because then uh, LP is going to go into right. physical training. Yeah, yeah, let's go. Let's take some questions, Lauren, if you're ready. Yeah, I can be ready. <laughs> uh, so you're mentioning that this was phase two, where there's a lot of questions that, that people asked in the forum or the uh, Q&A and then in the group chat about phase three. Uh, if you could just clarify maybe um, details around that, if we have any. Yeah, for sure. Uh, the, the, the stage three uh, protocol is currently with uh, our board and it's been sent to our insurance and, uh, and, and public health uh, advisors. So right now it's in the process of being approved. So we're not going to make any recommendations tonight uh, as part of this because, again, it hasn't been approved. So, so we don't know. We know what you know. Uh, I mean, we can all read the news and, and the documents that we can find online. So we all know the same thing right now, but what the, the, the laws and, and what the orders are. Uh, but in terms of what that translates to for a protocol, um, we're waiting to get the approval of our board and stuff to, to talk about it. But you can be certain that as soon as we have that, uh, it will be published on our website. And uh, at the end, we'll tell you more details. I don't have them on top of my head, but uh, we're setting up another of these town halls very soon to, to talk about that, actually. So. so LP covered off my slide, so that's good. We'll do that. <laughs> Thanks, yeah. LP. No, it's good. That's exactly it. That's exactly where we're in with our next steps. So, and I'll, yeah. Great. Yeah. I just have one more question here. Uh, Joanne, you mentioned uh, insurance, uh, not covering COVID, but will insurance still be provided for clubs in January? Oh, insurance is still provided now. Any specific insurance questions you have, please send them in to us and we'll make sure that we make it very, um, uh, just more detail related to your specific question. But when we say COVID isn't covered, it, it's an exclusion. So that's just, there's not any policy that's covering COVID. Now, what other provinces had done is that um, BC's government had made an made it so that no one can be sued because of COVID. Ontario government um, has not gone that far yet, even though the group of sports, we are trying to lobby for that at this time. And this is why it's very, very important that all the clubs are following the protocols and the return to play guidelines and have your paperwork you know, in hand, you have it electronically and saved because at any time the health unit can ask for information for contact tracing if there was an outbreak and so forth. And then if, you know, God forbid something happens to the insurance and someone is trying to sue the club, you wanna make sure that you have everything and you have everything documented. So make sure you are following everything to the T. Definitely. And LP, you were mentioning uh, on court. So uh, people are mentioning that it says 10 people per court. Does that include coach? Yes. Okay, go on up. Yeah, okay. You got it. I think, was there another question though around the gathering of 10 and a double gym? Yeah, you read my mind, Joanne. That's the next question and how that pertains to uh, double gym spaces. The, uh, do you want me to answer that one, Joanne? Go for it. Okay, so essentially, um, uh, well, you know, I can answer because we had this discussion last week 
for for our Team Ontario uh, programs as well. So essentially, um, the way it's kind of worded um, with the law is that um, you know, as an organizer, essentially you you can gather ten people. So if you're going to have two courts, you know, in a gym that are separated by you know uh, an acceptable acceptable distance, you essentially need two organizers. So you need two organizers to complete the protocol and get the documents ready and sign the um, uh, acknowledgement form and all that stuff. So you essentially need to treat it as two different events. Um, and then you also need to make sure that you have two check-ins so that the athletes are not checking in just in one spot and then going to two different courts, but they're checking in in their respective uh, place. So you really just need to treat it as two different events where people are not mingling and, 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 and mixing. Um, and then, uh, but then you should yeah. be able to find your court. Yeah, and that's um, and what LP is talking about, create it as two different organizers. So if you're one club operating, make sure that to protect you as the club leader that you do have, you've run through that protocol with that, uh, call it the organizer for your club of those, those separate groups. So make sure that you've, you, they're well versed in the protocol that they've signed off on an acknowledgement form. And that, as LP says, there's staggered times, there's different check-ins, like you need to make it separate and do the, the due diligence to make it separate behind that. And the facility has to accept it. That's the other thing, because the facility is the one accepting liability. So the facility may say, no, sorry. For sure. Okay, uh, I think we can move on and then we'll come back to some other questions that have popped up later. Awesome. Okay, so the other thing we wanted to tell you tonight is share some information on what we're currently working on for all of you uh, for the fall. And so, I mean, we're all in this situation together. Um, we all know how it feels. And the one thing that's the most frustrating uh, at least to me, is not being able to control much. Before, and, and I'll speak for our Team Ontario programs, um, we could book a facility, we would tell coaches it's going to be this day, we're going to have this number of athletes. We had control over a lot of things in order to provide a great training opportunity to athletes. Now, there's not a lot of certainty, so not a lot of control over, over things. And, um, and so it's been actually really good uh, this past few months for us to take a big breath and look at what we can control. And, and, and what we realized we could control was um, the delivery of online support to athletes. And so we went ahead and ran uh, and still are running. We're running it this month, actually. We're in uh, just started the uh, fourth week of our Team Ontario online program. And so far, we're getting a lot of really positive comments from both the coaches involved and the athletes. And we basically uh, made the decision so that we wouldn't be waiting to hear from, uh, can we go in person? Can we not? We said, let's go ahead, full force. Let's plan a really good program online. Let's control what we can control. And, and we'll, have, uh, we'll have some fun and it will be good. And it is. It is fun and it is good. And we're learning a lot of, uh, a lot of things while running this program. And... Um, you know, we were thinking about the fall and realized that a lot of you and, and you know, um, in the clubs all over the province may be in that exact situation. You may not know if you can get a permit. You may not be able to get one. Maybe you do. Maybe you don't. So um, because there's still a lot of that uncertainty, we wanted to make sure that we could provide you with some support to help you control what you can control. And so we're working on putting together um, a bunch of, I guess, information and resources to help you address uh, uh, off-court training with your athletes in the fall, right? So if you can't get a gym, if you cannot get on the court with your athletes, well, here's a bunch of things that you can do. So we're looking, uh, we're going to put together all of the best practices that we've learned about from our Team Ontario program. We have uh, over 500 athletes involved in this program with close to 100 coaches, so a lot of people involved, a lot of great stuff happening. So we're gonna basically put a summary together of what all of those, you know, um, aha moments and all of those really cool things that happen are and how you can make them happen. We'll share uh, the things that we learned about the tools that we used so that you can, you can look into them if you wanna use them for the delivery of your own programs. 
Um, we'll have some ready to use PowerPoints that our coaches have developed over the course of this Team Ontario online program that you can just take, uh, brand as you want, and then uh, use with your athletes, essentially, right, for, for online presentations and stuff like that. We'll have, some, um, we'll have some resources that have been vetted in terms of the quality uh, of them in um, nutrition, strength and conditioning, mental performance, that type of stuff. Uh, nothing, you know, forced on you or anything, but just resources that you can look into and that you can access if you, if you wish to. We just want to be there and offer some, uh, some ideas for you to be able to run something with the athletes, right? Um, if, if you can't get on court. So, so that's one. And then the other thing that we're working on right now, and um, I actually have a call with our coach committee tomorrow. Um, we are looking at creating a, a framework to allow uh, coaches, clubs to connect with uh, expert coaches. Okay, so let's just call it call them that way. Um, uh, I have been in communication with some OUA, OCAA coaches, some of our current Team Ontario coaches, some uh, senior coaches in our community with lots of years of experience. And um, what we want to do is use this opportunity in the fall. Uh, right now, a lot of the post-secondary programs are not starting until later in the fall and you know November and, and December potentially so um, a lot of post-secondary coaches are very interested in connecting with you guys and so what we want to do is create that uh, framework so that that connection is easier and so if you want to as a coach access um, either a session or a mentorship opportunity with a particular post-secondary coach you can if you want one of them to come and talk to your team um, and do a session on a skill or something like that, you can. Um, so we're kind of working on that framework uh, and then, you know, working also with the, the post-secondary coaches to look at what, what does it look like, right? And how do you connect with them? Uh, so we're doing that. So we don't have the details of that, but we just want to tell you that that's where we're working on. And in the next few weeks, uh, you'll have more details on how that's going to happen so that you can start, uh, planning for some of those sessions um, as you have also a better idea of what your September and rest of the fall um, will uh, will look like um, and so so yeah so just 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 wanted you to know that that we're thinking about you and um, we want to provide as much support and resources as as we can to help you navigate uh, this uncertainty and so that we can still you know support the athletes the best we can even though at some point we may be um, kept from uh, from the courts um, for different reasons. Um, so um, so yeah, I think that's 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 that piece. All right, back to Joanne. Sure, unless Lauren, there's any questions in there for LP on any of that, or they can always email them. Um, uh, yeah, no questions uh, for that right now, but yeah, definitely reach out to LP if you have some. It was so clearly explained. <laughs> <laughs> Very high performance. Thank you. Um, so just to touch on um, stage three, and as LP kind of took us through where we are at uh, with that for the OVA. Um, also then we can go back to, I'm sure people have thought of uh, some more return to play uh, questions, Lauren, so we can always go back to answering um, any of those as well and any that we missed um, earlier on. Um, so for stage three, um, this is exciting because now we get to play volleyball. So this is the part where um, we're diligently getting through trying to figure out what the government means when it says no physical contact. So um, it is not defined. So the government, so to, to make it um, really tricky for the sports, um, they put out their government regulations and it just said, you're not allowed to have physical contact. And everyone's like, well, what does that mean? Um, the sports are actually, we've been meeting, trying to put some more verbiage around what that means. Um, so some of the things that gets thrown around is prolonged and deliberate physical contact. So 
stage three regions with return to play protocol uh, for us for volleyball, once we get our return to play protocol, there is some volleyball that can happen. Um, and I say some, I go, because there still has to be some modifications. We have to, we have to make sure that physical contact is avoided and um, that there's no prolonged or deliberate physical contact during any of the session. Um, so there's still some, a uh, lot of wording and modification um, that needs to be put together and approved. So as LP said, go back to our return to play protocol, what it involves. We go through legal and insurance and all those different um, protocol that we, we go through to get it approved. But for team sports, they did put in an exception. Um, so that's what we're working with right now. Uh, we're working with documenting that protocol of what that means for volleyball for outdoor indoor and just to clarify i think um we always refer to obviously beach volleyball and indoor volleyball but we did read we did very purposely our return to play protocol is called outdoor because it's beach and grass so this is where it's like um, we really want you to be able to adapt and you know some indoor teams may want to be practicing on grass um, so then you would use the outdoor protocol. So with outdoor protocol, you can have more people. So the, these are like in the, and then in this stage three, right? So this, these are things to keep in mind that there's different rules for outdoor and indoor. Outdoor um, from our NSO is, and for anyone is under, is preferred, right? So for example, outdoor, your coaches wouldn't be required to wear a mask, right? So there's different things um, to consider. Um, and then for indoor, don't forget that would mean indoor sand as well. Um, so please keep that in mind. Um, so with stage um, three, there's going to be different gathering sizes and key and physical distancing is still required. So <laughs> there's an exception for when the team sport is actually played, but not for everything else that happens. Whenever the athlete enters, the coach, the participants, anyone, maintain physical distancing is required. So these are the things that it's actually creates a lot of the modifications um, where we have to really think about um, what's going to happen uh, when there's a timeout, right? So any like static interaction, if the game's not being played, you wouldn't be, you're not allowed to breach any um, physical distancing and you must go back to um, maintaining physical distancing. If your team is warming up off the court, you must maintain physical distancing. So there's a lot of um, things to think about, um, but the exciting part is with some modifications, um, there's, a, there's some you know, volleyball gameplay um, and modified uh, competition, I'm saying that because it still has to be worked out, um, that can't be prolonged, um, that can start to happen in stage three regions. Um, so we're, we're obviously super excited about that as we try to uh, work through what all of that uh, means. Um, so where are we at? Um, our stage three, for stage three communities, let's figure out all of these uh, stages and phases, what we're talking about. So when the government talks about stage three regions for outdoor return to play for uh, volleyball, um, there are return to play protocols drafted, it's under review. So it's under review with insurance and our board. Um, we've gone through some legal, so we're pretty excited with that. We'll book another town hall. I hope I have the right date there uh, next Monday um, to talk about that one. Um, and the team, our beach uh, competition crew is also working on some um, exhibition uh, gameplay opportunities uh, for August, um, uh, potentially at some facilities. And when I say it's modified, it's, uh, it's um, limited. It's not a tournament. This tournament, full tournament would not be allowed. Um, and our stage three indoor will follow shortly. Um, it, it, our indoor return to play protocol, um, because the requirements are similar, except for like different gathering sizes and, and indoor uh, limitations, um, it's pretty similar. Um, so you'll start to see that it's, um, if you start to look at our documents, um, any mod revisions, we're keeping it in green. You can start to see where things are changing and start to follow along with, um, return to play and it's not a daunting task of reviewing the, our whole 30 pages all over again. Um, so again, we'll then follow up with some town hall and talk about uh, stage three when we get 
that point. And go for it, Lauren, hit me with some questions. Great, <clears throat> excuse me. So um, talking about stage three, uh, there's a specific question about uh, hitting and blocking situations. Do we have any idea if that will be allowed in the phase three? Uh, what we're looking at right now is um, we do have blocking in there. Um, it's still under review whether um, a double block would be um, deliberate physical contact or not. So that's questionable. So we'll follow up with more uh, to come. For sure. Um, so we mentioned the indoor and outdoor. So say a team wanted to uh, get outdoors, but practice it more like a, at a private home where there's uh, grass and area to do so. Do they still have to make sure all the waivers and all the protocols are followed, signed, even to do that on a private facility? Yes, if there are OBA members operating under OBA, yes. And the club, right? The club would, would, also, would, would also want that. For sure. Um, is there any new protocols then for phase three in terms of sanitation? And, and so like the, the volleyballs, um, the sharing of the balls, that sort of thing. Is there any new information for that or is that still the same? Um, what we have to consider now is, um, I, at least if I remember if I changed something directly in the return to play protocol, but we have recommendations also of, so the volleyball is being cleaned after each session, um, but also the athletes and the, any participant that has touched the volleyballs, especially if they're going to start now because you may have a gameplay situation where you're playing someone else, they're um, hand sanitizing or cleaning in between when they change to another uh, team to play, for example. So every 30 minutes, I think, was our recommendation when there's a break in the uh, practice or the game session. Right, OK. Um, and then there was two questions about uh, sanctioning teams or clubs who don't necessarily follow our protocols or the policies in place? Is that something that will be happening? Great question. I mean, that's a tough one. I mean, we really want to keep our community safe and we are really relying on, um, you know, people really taking these protocols as um, keeping everyone safe. Uh, Cause we've got to remember these athletes coach, they're going home to potentially vulnerable or compromised, um, uh, people with um, at risk. So there's not something that, I mean, we don't have a sanction, uh, but we do have, we're not the regulators, but uh, the facility uh, will obviously be the ones liable and bylaw officers are the ones that would uh, hand out some hefty fines. Uh, and I would say too, is we really have to take these protocols seriously and I think we need, that's our responsibility as a sport. I think it really sucked for everybody when everything got shut down, that we lost the end of the hour of our season, that we lost OCs, that we lost our beach season. It really, really sucked. And, you know, we're all eager to start again, but, you know, it's the same thing with all regulations put in place right now. It's, it, they, all, all, they are there to, you know, in order for us to not go back to what we were in and, and, and that situation at the end of March there. So I think it's our responsibility to follow the protocols so that we can keep playing some sort of volleyball so that we're not in a situation where we get shut down again. And I would say that like the worst sanction that there could be for anyone in here is if we get sh you know, shut down again and we can't play. So, you know, um, I, th I think we all need to be responsible as a community. And the more we do that, I think the more likely we are to keep playing and slowly, you know, get back to where we want to be. So. Yeah, it's especially when, um, like LP saying, it's for our sport because right now these protocols get set by our sport, and if they now realize that, oh well, this whole group playing volleyball was um, obviously um, got sick, then they are going to review and they're going to cut back on what our protocol is. And that would just be terrible for everybody. 
Um, and that, you know, that's something that uh, we do have an opportunity now to mitigate a lot of risks. Um, you know, cleaning the volleyballs diligently, making sure that our athletes or participants are washing their hands, doing the screening prior to people coming in. Like there's so many ways to mitigate the risks that we have to be diligent to protect our sport. So uh, I, I don't know what else we can do with that to sort of keep, you know, hammering that home. For sure. And, and another question was just asked here about uh, would insurance be void if they don't follow protocols? Uh, what the, <laughs> you're at risk of being sued. So <laughs> yeah, you're going to put yourself in a liable situation if you don't follow protocols, unfortunately. Right. Uh, there were two questions asked uh, in terms of getting tested and having your test results come back quickly and then having your team as your bubble to allow to, to train in more close settings, I guess. Is that uh, covered or recommended thoughts? Um, at this time, there's not that bubble for amateur sports that the government has allowed. Uh, when they're doing that with any pro teams or any of the other teams, those have gone through separate protocols and approval process. And that's not the direction they've gone right now with amateur sport. And if you are making your team your bubble and your social circle, you're basically cutting ties to your family. <laughs> so you would be like, I am now staying with these 10 people, technically, if you read yeah, the laws and stuff. But no matter what, that facility can't follow that social circle anyways. No. Or that no, bubble. exactly. So you, you're, it's not going to matter. Like, yeah, okay, go ahead. But you, you can't then go and it doesn't allow you to get a permit or go into a facility. Mm -hmm. It allows you to, you know, yeah. Anyways. Right, for sure. Uh, do the volleyball protocols uh, apply to OVA member clubs or all leagues, including recreational leagues as well? Uh, OVA members and any um, events that we sanction. So the separate uh, recreational leagues that are, aren't under us, we, we don't have any jurisdiction over them. Okay, great. Um, I have some other questions, not so much based on phase three. I don't know where we're at in the uh, topics to be covered, Joanne. Just throw them at us. Okay. Well done. Great. <laughs> I'm just going to ask some more questions then. Uh, I have some questions. I think this is for Carrie more about roster sizes. Um, I know that we, we had talked about having the 10 people uh, in the gym. Will roster sizes be affected based on the different stages or phases, sorry, that we're in? So, for example, if we go to phase... Three, do you think they'd be allowed more? I know that's still up in the air, but uh, there was a couple questions on that. Um, I don't know if Joe can touch on this too, but I would assume that if you're allowed 10 people, then then 10 people should be on your roster and then maybe add as if it opens up. Um, that, would, that would be my suggestion. I don't know, LP, Joanne, Alicia. Uh, I think that's a tough question because um, I don't think we have an answer for this, but... Um, let's say you start, I mean, I think we can expect, hopefully, that by September we're in stage three across the province. Uh, so if you do start signing athletes and you say, okay, well, I'm gonna sign 12 athletes to my team because your indoor gathering at that point is, uh, is 50 athletes. Uh, so you do that, that's fine. There are some more restrictions put in place. We go back to stage two. Now the max is 10. So what do you even do for training if, if you can get in the gym? So I, I, I don't quite know. Um, I think that's going to come down to you and what you think is going to happen this year and how many athletes you want to have and how you think you can manage your team. Um, but, uh, but yeah, that's a great question. Yeah, it certainly is a tough question. Um, and it's back to the everything being so uncertain the one thing um potentially is in stage three is where the gathering sizes um will we will stay in stage three as the 
any one of the announcements, they said it pretty, pretty clearly, clearly when they said for the foreseeable future, I went, ooh, ouch. So we will be in stage three, um, and hopefully not go backwards, but be in stage three for quite some time. Um, but that's where there will be modifications to stage three with hopefully, let's all cross our fingers to increase that, especially for indoor volleyball, that indoor gathering size. But don't forget, you're still going to be limited by the facility. So that's still going to be a tough situation with the facility. So, um, and this is where I say, and my staff have heard me say this, we need to, to really think differently. We need to be innovative and adaptive to what will make sense for a training size. Um, you know, maybe we do have smaller training groups, um, but you know, those groups come together to make one team. Like uh, we do have to think of other ways of, of to be adapt, uh, to, to adapt to the situation. Um, you know, it is this, when the weather's great, it'll be, it will be a great opportunity for, I know it's not indoor, but for the, the athletes can practice some of their skills out on the grass, uh, because you can get more of them together. It's easier to have access to, uh, you know, to a field. Um, so those are the things that it's going to be really tricky. And I really, I, I don't know. <laughs> Sorry. That's a tough one. Yeah, for sure. And there's just a couple comments coming here into the group chat as well for um, uh, having the rule of two in place as well. So that would mean that on court, technically, you would have um, eight athletes, right? Or if you had two coaches, or if there was a parent there who had to, who was acting as that second person. Uh, is that correct when I'm saying that or? Yeah. It is. Um, the one thing is, is that there is under that stage two uh, regulation where a minor can have their uh, parent or guardian, um, they're allowed to be there. So technically you have a case for them to be outside of the 10, um, but that's facility dependent uh, and permit dependent. Some of them are very strict with only the 10. Others were allowing that parent um to be there and not count as the 10. Um, but the bonus is in stage three is that um it is 50 um and then if the facility could hold it it would be 50 plus 50 spectators so. and joanne in stage three as well i know that they mentioned that staff are not included in the numbers and we've been going back and forth with liar, lawyers and insurance yep. throughout this to see if the coaching staff from the club actually technically is staff so are they on top of the 50 and is that something we could go back to the government on in the stage two um with the 10 technically would coaches nope that's it okay i'm trying it's the facility <laughs> it's it, you the facility's liable so you, you're back to the facility okay great uh, so moving on to another roster question. Um, are teams allowed to fill rosters completely without tryouts? Um, through, if you're resigned, if you have an application process, yeah, there's no need for a tryout. Um, it doesn't have to happen at whatever, you know, there's, we encourage uh, resigning um, and we would, there's sure there's teams that are going to walk into September that are already solidified that are ready to start training. Um, so absolutely, you don't have to have tryouts. Okay, great. And then how will this affect the younger teams, like 12U, 13U, because uh, those are new athletes to the sport, presumably, mm -hmm. so. Mm -hmm. I think, um, you know, we talk, talked about that a little bit and uh, we would hope that um, teams would be able to go into this application process, um, considering that we've allowed the resigning extended until the August uh, 31st with a great idea of where their club stands and what they want to offer. Um, and I think it's really important with these younger kids that you kind of focus on uh, a development uh, mindset rather than a winning mindset. And you kind of go through your applications and vet them as, as what you see fits with your club rather than what's going to, you know, potentially win you medals. Um, you know, we have talked about it a bit, throwing the idea of this really being focused on a, de uh, de this season really being focused on development for a lot of clubs and a lot of teams. Um, so it, it is gonna be a tricky process. And again, um, we're not, if you have the ability to run a tryout um, legally, um, safely, then do so, you know, that's, that's great, um, do it. But we also have this application process there if it's not available. Um, so it, it's gonna be tricky. 
Yeah, and something, too, we've been talking about, we still haven't figured out, but if, you know, your club runs house league programs, these kids have been your house league programs, but technically never been on a traveling rep team, um, you know, technically they've already been part of the club. Can they not just re-sign those athletes and put them on their now rep 12U or 13U team? So that's, you know, a conversation we've been having, and that's something we can look at as well to make sure these kids have been with you guys already in that club, or, you know, house league program. So just move them onto the rep side without a tryout. Yeah, for sure. And uh, kind of along this same uh, tone with the rosters, um, do you think athletes will be eligible to play up tournaments or uh, will they be able to put on multiple rosters given that the roster sizes could be smaller, maybe more injuries, that sort of thing? Maybe tricky questions. I don't know. <laughs> Uh, tricky questions. Yeah, for sure. Um, obviously, there's an opportunity to play up in the calendar as a team, then, you know, um, go for it. I think we'd have to be very mindful of um, the health uh, regulations that are out there from the public health boards and what's in your region and, um, you know, doing what's best for the athlete and making sure that you're keeping them in mind and their safety in mind. But yeah, it's, it's tricky. It's hard to say, you know, we might be all open come January, but I um, have to wait and see. Fingers crossed. Um, was there any consideration for running more of like a league structure as opposed to tournament based uh, competition? Um, you know, we are looking at everything under the sun right now. Um, we really do not know what January is going to bring yet. Um, it's a lot depending on gathering size. It's a lot dependent on health regulations, government regulations. So, um, you know, we um, were kind of looking at league play, playing bubbles within your region, um, you know, uh, looking at having four teams come into a venue, allowing cleaning time, and then another four teams come in a venue, and you get, you know, X amount of games. We're all, we're brainstorming right now to try to come up with a number of plans that will fit any type of uh, stage regulations that's, that we're allowed to do. So yeah, it very well, the come January, uh, it, it very well may not be your regular nine on three schedule, um, six on two, you know, for league ladder, you know, we don't, we're, we're not sure. For sure, definitely. Uh, there is a question about uh, the new volleyballs for the season, will clubs still need to uh, purchase those? You don't have so to purchase it's, them at all. Yeah, oh, go, go it's, never, yeah it's, it's never mandatory. Um, if you don't want to switch the balls and don't want to have the expense this year, you don't have to. Um, when we did the press release back last October um, for the new balls being released this fiscal year, we had to put our order in in November. So the OB has to move forward with the new balls. Um, but like I said, as the club, you choose not to, you don't have to, you can still practice with the old balls, um, before they get, uh, phased out by Macasa. Gotcha. And then Carrie, uh, when you resign an athlete, does that guarantee them to a specific team or is that within the club? Um, it's the required information should be listed on that form. Um, there is, it does say it's required. However, there is a, a spot for a, uh, extra conditions, if you will, on your offer. So if you're not sure where that athlete is gonna, gonna fit, then you can write in that other conditions, a little blurb that, that fits that certain athlete situation, but the information is required on that uh, signing sheet with that little caveat. Okay. Definitely. Um, there's a question here about uh, having like a, a date that's a no or no go for the season. Is that something that you guys are working within or? Um, we haven't thought of it. I'm not, I'm not going to lie. Our hearts are set on January um, until we for, turn further down that path. Then that's when we're, we're going to any indications that maybe um, that permits won't be completely available or anything like that, then I think maybe we'll maybe um, be forced to look at that. But right now we're uh, really pushing for that um, January start and, you know, and having these town halls is one of the ways that we're pushing for that, making sure our clubs are educated, that we're doing things the right way. Um, and that, you know, we're, we're doing this properly. So January can happen. 
And we've also been looking and talking about too, in terms of the go, no go is um, like we've done on the beach this past season is, you know, we wanted to give six to eight weeks before canceling events, not knowing what things are going to happen and regulations coming forth and the case is going up again. So realistically, if we do a work back plan from January by November, um, we will know if we're going to be able to start having events or not in January. So a lot of that time frame is what we'd be looking at. Definitely. <clears throat> See me. Um, there's been a couple questions here about uh, cost for clubs and teams to participate in the OVA, if that's going to change this year. Um, are there any comments on that? Alicia, do you want to take this one? <laughs> yeah, for sure. So realistically, Joe, I know, I don't know if you want to talk about membership fees right now. Nothing's changing on the OVA side of things. Volleyball Canada's membership fee is going up a dollar again. Uh, it's gone up a dollar, I think, every year for the last five or six years. Um, unfortunately, tournament registration fees will have to go up. We're looking at PPE for our hosts. We're looking at additional cleaning costs. Um, right now we're in the middle of doing the budgets for, you know, a regular January start date with all the additions added on. Um, it has to go to our board and get approved still. Um, but yeah, we're hoping to get those fees out as soon as possible so the clubs can, you know, proceed with their proper budgeting for the upcoming season. Um, so yes, as I say, we are looking at, uh, you know, a, some sort of increase in tournament registration fees um, just to cover that stuff. But hopefully, you know, it's not like $100, maybe $25 to $40 max, I'm hoping, but um, we will get that out as soon as possible. And that will be on the website, Alicia? Yeah, we'll email it all out. We have the what's new and everything that is going out there. Um, it's kind of just sitting waiting because we don't have the crystal ball. We don't know what the fall is looking like, but um, we're hoping to get that out early August and then have another town hall session based on all of that information. There's even story, I'm just looking at Chris's uh, suggestion. We were even talking about um, instead of purchasing a full membership, just looking at a rec membership fee, um, you know, for the beginning of the year until we know we can start having the tournament. So instead of collecting the full 47 plus the VC fees, it would only be $7. Um, but once again, stay tuned. It's coming in as soon as we can get it out there. Awesome, thanks. Uh, so there's just a, another clarification uh, question around re-signing, Carrie. Uh, so when a player receives a re-signing from a club, that means they cannot try out for another club, correct? Only if they sign that form back. Um, if you, your club asks you to come back and your athlete, you know, is, doesn't want to, um, they don't, as long as they don't return that signed form, um, they can uh, go to into September um, looking for a new club. But as soon as an athlete has signed back that form, they are committed to you. And if there's any change in mindset, then they do have to go through the athlete transfer policy, um, the release request section, and um, you as a club can, uh, you know, decide to release that athlete or try to work together so that you can start September together. Great, okay. Uh, LP, I have a question for you, I think. This is for you. <laughs> um, would the OVA consider relaxing coach certifications? Uh, specifically, in-class components might be difficult to get this year, uh, so thoughts on that? Yeah, for sure. So um, in the next little while, um, when we also release information about the what's new, we will release our uh, coach eligibility policy for this year. And so um, some, 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 I think will say that they are relaxed. Um, so I guess the answer would be yes, but it's not in relation to COVID and the current situation. Uh, it really just is um, in relation to what makes sense uh, for our community and where we want to move with um, coach development and, and also safe sports in, uh, in Ontario. So uh, that will be released very, very uh, shortly, um, but uh, I, I'm sure you will find it um, some sort of relaxed. I hope that's enough information for now. Sorry, I know it's like, code <laughs> it will we'll, we'll put out that uh, we're just waiting for volleyball canada they had a meeting with the development uh, domestic development committee uh like last thursday uh, and i'm just waiting to hear back from them um with with their policy and then we'll set everything out at the same time awesome okay 
Uh, I'm just scrolling through the chat box here, just making sure that we've kind of talked about most of these topics. Um, oh, Gilles asked uh, if our refund policy will be changing this year uh, for clubs or teams or being updated, maybe I should say. Joe, I'm throwing this one to you. Um, does it ask what the uh, modification would be? Uh, just in terms of like clubs uh, taking money from people in September and then maybe say, for example, we go back to phase one and then we can't have any competition or something like that, I'm assuming. Uh, we will review it and see if we need to add anything in for COVID. Uh, related, but uh, the OVA's refund policy, we had no issue as far as if we don't run the event, there's a, re there was a um, full refund that was um, issued from Ontario Championships. Um, so I'm not sure if there's some more specifics, if they want to throw them into us, just email it um, into our info at ontariovolleyball.org, um, specifically around the refund. That would be awesome. And that would actually be my comment too. If there's anything people think of, um, we are going to be collecting an FAQ um, and they can email it into Sherry at info at ontariovolleyball.org. And I was going to just comment, I think there was a question around masks and indoor. Um, I, I can't remember the exact question, but um, um, just to comment around, it's not recommended by the World Health Organization um, for athletes to be wearing masks during their physical activity. Um, obviously, I'm not an expert in the health, but if, if you, the, the trick part here is that that's not set by the provincial government. So sport associations have asked the provincial government to put that rule in, um, but the provincial government came back and said, that's actually going to be by municipality. So we have all the sport organizations. We do have letters ready to go to certain municipalities if they start to require athletes to wear masks indoors. Um, so that's something that um, if that you do come across that in your uh, local area, let us know because we wanna contact that municipality um, and actually share with them the World Health Organization recommendation of not to wear masks while you're doing the physical activity. Thank you. Thanks, Joanne. But Joanne, so technically, if the, when the kids are playing and the coach is coaching, they would not have to wear the mask. As soon as they step off the, the court and they're leaving, they should be putting masks on or same thing coming into the facility um, and hanging out between matches. That's when the facility or the public health regulations would state that they would have to wear a mask. If that's what it is in their local area, yes. Yeah. Okay. But so, as we know, right, it's go, that's where you have to be aware of what's, what's relevant in your area and what the rules are in your area and, and in your facility, right? So every facility um, will have their rules and their protocol that even if that local health, if it's not required, that facility may require it. So always go to with, um, <laughs> we just have to check every level of the rules now, everywhere. So. Um, and as Joe jo mentioned earlier in her presentation, like every time we have a new updated return to play protocol for indoor or outdoor, we're emailing those to all of the public health units across Ontario where we have clubs. So any feedback that we're getting, Joanne has been sending it out to, you know, people letting them know that, hey, above and beyond the OVA return to play protocol, your, you know, community health unit is also requiring X, Y, or Z. So make sure in your plan that you have that. Um, so, you know, just to kind of help the clubs with the situation and kind of being up to speed with everything that's out there. Awesome. Uh, I missed a question earlier, but someone reposted it. Um, thoughts around teams unable to attend due to a positive test within a team prior to a uh, OVA competition or event, a league, however the structure is. Yep, this is something we've talked about as well um, internally and we will be discussing with the Indoor Volleyball Development Committee as well as our regional presidents. Um, you know, we teams have had two missed tournaments at the last minute due to stomach flu and the entire team being out. And um, unfortunately, if it's, you know, a day before an event and the team can't go um, because there's a positive case on that team and they've been practicing, obviously, within the last week together, um, 
you know, there are costs that we have to incur regardless if the team is there or not late at that point. So that's something that we need to talk about. Um, so stay tuned. Um, you know, it's kind of what Joanne said that we'll be looking again at that refund policy to see what it looks like. But once again, it may not be 100% refund policy. But, um, you know, if we're shut down by the health regulations and the government, once again, it'd be like an OC's uh, full refund to the team. So stay tuned. We'll, we'll report back on that one. Awesome. And another question for you, Carrie, about uh, Triple Ball and if you have any updates or considerations for how Triple Ball will work in the upcoming season with uh, the ball having to be tossed over the net. I can, I can take that one, Carrie, if you want. I do. <laughs> okay. Uh, so if we uh, talk about Triple Ball, it means that we are talking about competition. It means that we are talking about at least stage three which allows for 50 people indoors. Um, so uh, what that means is that, well, whoever um, is tossing the ball has to do just like the athletes and wash your hands, sanitize before the game and after the game uh, and, in, and in between sets as well. Um, but the good thing is that that person can actually um, physical distance themselves from all the other players. So that's an added bonus um, for us. So I don't really see any modifications to triple ball um happening with these um these these restrictions i think uh, i think if, if if we get to a point where we can play um we'll be able to do uh to do triple ball Woo. all right um okay so i think we've covered most of these questions here either in the beginning part of the presentation or through uh just some more conversation we've had now if anyone has any other pressing questions or something that I may have missed, which is very possible, uh, please feel free to write in the chat box now and I can ask our amazing panel here. Do you guys have anything to add while we're kind of waiting for these last questions to come in? Nope, perfect, okay. <laughs> Sorry, I think there was one. I think Stephen Green asked about the AAU event down in Florida. <laughs> I'm like, oh God, let's um, get political. Yeah. Um, you know, and key learnings in, in watching that event take place. And, you know, it's a lot of what we did with Ontario Championships this past spring when things were shutting down and it was constant contact with the public health unit, the ministry, the city of Toronto, uh, moving things online, doing coach check-ins online. Things that they have done that we will have to look at moving forward um, is potential size limitations, right? So AAU, I think it was 25 people max that they allowed per team. So that included your players, your coaching staff, and chaperones. So if you have 15 kids on your roster, maybe not all 15 sets of parents and guardians are allowed into that event, just to minimize the, size, the gathering sizes to make sure that event can move forward. Um, so for me, you know, it's a lot of just once again reviewing and making sure we're continuing to do the best practices that we have um, and that constant communication and making sure we're working with the public health units and the government and the facilities to make sure we're meeting all regulations. So for me, that's kind of the takeaway from the AU and kind of sitting back and looking at the, the little petri dish and the test case to see kind of what happens and hope to God there's not a ton of transmission because it's not going to look great for our sports when all these teams go back to their states, but um, if they're spreading things, so fingers crossed. And uh, hopefully it's okay. Nice. All right, great. So I don't see any new questions here in the chat box. Um, we will be posting the recording, correct, on our OVA website. Uh, for those who came late or would like to rewatch again, uh, you can find the recording there. Except for the first five minutes, because we forgot. I, it usually starts automatically, and, and we just noticed it later that it did not. So we've missed the first five minutes. Well, that's, job, that was me trying to unmute and mute. So that's perfect. So we're fine. I appreciate that. Thank you. <laughs> I love how you support me on that. Um, but I just really want to thank everyone um, for taking the time out on <laughs> a summer evening to join us. Um, it's not easy. I mean, my staff, the staff have been diligently uh, working through all different scenarios. And we know that that trickles right down to our whole community. And that it's really difficult for everyone at this time. But we love our sport and we hope to get it into action whatever way we can. So we will keep digging away at it. And if you have ideas, thoughts, please send them into us. Um, it's uh, Sherry's really good at filtering the info at OntarioVolleyball.org, but also go to our group that's here. 
and you know your YC or youth competitions team is always uh, fielding your emails. So thank you for um, really uh, staying open to different ideas. And I know if we work together, we will get volleyball back on the court and in the sand. So thank you. And I was joking with Joanne, am I muted? Nope, I was joking with Joanne earlier today. I'm like, oh, you know what? I feel like we should just throw it out there right now. Everyone keep every Monday night open from now until the end of August. Because <laughs> I feel like we'll have a town hall session every Monday. Um, so stay tuned. <laughs> My plan's yeah. free. It's a free. We look forward to it, it'll be fun. Yeah. <laughs> I'll figure out how to unmute, share, and do all that fun stuff. <laughs> we'll just take presentation mode away from Joanne, it's fine. <laughs> awesome. So thank you, everyone. Well, thanks, thank thanks everyone. Have a good evening. Have a good evening, everyone. Night.